Hey everybody, welcome back. CM.3 is expanding upon what we learned about in the last video, applying Newton's second law for things moving in circles. Just like we saw in the past sequence of videos that we're really focusing on Newton's second law, here we're going to spend a video or two looking at some applications, some different scenarios where you have an object moving in a circle, and what are the different ways you can apply Newton's second law in order to calculate speeds, size of forces, things like that. In this scenario, we're looking at flat car turns. So imagine, you know, you're just driving on the road on a flat, uh, flat surface and you're making a turn. What's going on there? And start looking at vertical circles, okay? So to start us off, flat turns. Here I have a diagram of a car and it's moving along a circle, okay? Now, to be honest, whether or not it's a perfect half circle like this diagram, or even if it's just like a little tiny fraction of a curve, for that moment, for that fraction, heck, even if the curve is kind of changing, and of course in real life, uh, engineers aren't able to make roads perfect or half circles, okay, even if the curve is kind of changing in sharpness and magnitude, well, you can always, at a particular chunk of time, simplify this motion as some curve with some fraction of a circle. Okay, whether or not R is sustained for an entire circle, a half circle, even just maybe a, a few meters, you can still apply Newton's second law. The idea of centripetal forces still apply. So here I have a car. This is a top-down view, and here I have almost like a side view, a rear view of the car. Okay, and it's moving along. Here I have this nice half circle to, to keep it simple. Let's say the radius of this circle is R, and the velocity tangent, right, is some V tangential. Okay, how would I draw a free body diagram? Let's start here with this top view, and I'll label this top view. Not that on problems you have to do multiple free body diagrams, but let's just make sure we understand what's happening, okay, from these different perspectives. Looking from the top down, I mean, of course there's weight, there's mg, and there's a normal force, but I can't really see that easily on this top down view, right? Because the weight is acting into my screen, and the normal force is kind of coming out of the screen. And I can't really draw that on a classic free body diagram. But what do we know? This object is moving in a circle. What must be acting on any object that's moving in a circle? There must be an acceleration, there must be a force, there must be a net force. Something must be causing that force, or that object, I'm sorry, to move in a circular path. Now, whether or not I know what this is, here I have some arrow, some force acting towards the center. And it turns out, what force is this? It's a frictional force. You know, there's no string here. There's no wall like our Gravitron ride or anything like that. There still has to be a force that's acting towards the center, and it turns out it's the friction between the road and the tires. That's what's going on. So now, and this is why I have both the side view and a top view, side view. Well, from a classic side view, I have that normal force going up. I have the weight. You could do W, FW. I'm going to put MG. And between the road and the tires, there is a frictional force. Yeah, every tire has some frictional force, but we can just simplify that. Let's just draw a single arrow like that. That's F. Ah, there is a frictional force. That's the force that's keeping the car moving in a circle. That's why you want some good friction, good treaded tires. Uh, if you're driving, especially on some icy scenario, it's the frictional force which keeps a car moving in a circle. So now in the second slide, I have the exact same scenario. I have my free body diagram right here, but now let's actually kind of go through the whole process, set up Newton's second law for this car moving in a circle, okay? So I have my free body diagram drawn. Let's write out the sum of the forces acting in the centripetal direction. Now remember, let's say towards the center, I'm gonna go like this, Okay, I'm not going to write out towards the center this time, but remember, that's important. Towards the center is positive. So I have this frictional force. That's going to be equal to m times a. That's the second law. The acceleration is the centripetal acceleration. That can be rewritten as mv squared divided by r, where this is that tangential velocity. Now, it's important. We learned two types of friction. What frictional force is this? It's a little weird. Is the car sliding? into the circle, into the center, or away? No. I mean, it's moving in a circle, but it's not sliding in or out. The wheels are not, if the car is keeping good grip, is not sliding across that asphalt. That means it's a static friction. Remember, it's kinetic when there's actual sliding taking place. It's not actually sliding inwards or outwards. The car is keeping it steady 
in that circular path, in that circumference. So it ends up being a static friction, okay? Unless the car is actually sliding and grinding out, it's gonna be static friction. Now, okay, do I remember what static friction is equal to? Technically, if you're showing all your work, right, you could now look at the sum of the forces in the y direction. Let's say upwards is positive. I have normal force minus mg is equal to ma in the y direction. That's zero, the car's not launching up or down. So therefore, I have the normal force equals mg. And that's important because the frictional force, I'm gonna change colors to orange. I'm gonna go like this, just so we have enough room. Frictional force, that's mu times the normal force, I'm just gonna skip this, mb squared divided by r, oh, that's mu times mg, right, right here, right here, I just plug that in, equals mv squared divided by r. Okay, here is our setup, applying Newton's second law for a car moving in a flat circle. Not too tough, but we did have to remember what static friction is equal to right here, and maybe if you wanted to prove it, you know, what do you plug in for, uh, for the normal force? In this case, just m times g. Now, not only is this just an algebra equation, this is actually very important that we think, what is the meaning? What is the physical meaning behind what this equation is saying? And it's important, and it often kind of misses people. It often goes over people's heads. This right here, remember, this is telling you what is necessary to move in a circle. If something is moving in a circle, there must be some net centripetal force towards the center, right? So this is saying the meaning. You want to go in a circle? Well, okay, you need a certain amount of total force. That amount of force, oh, it's based on the speed, and that probably makes sense, right? If you wanna go way faster, you're gonna need really grippy forces, really strong forces to keep you moving in a circle. So you wanna move in a circle? You need to have a certain amount of force based on the speed and based on R, the tightness, so to speak, of that circle. As we talked about probably before, if you have a sharper radius, well, you need more force to move in that circle. So this on the right hand side, this is kind of like, so you want to go in a circle, you need a certain force equal to this amount. And for a car, that means, well, look right here, you need a certain amount of grip. This is mu s, I kind of forgot that. You need a certain amount of grip between your tires and the road to move in a circle. That's why if you watch like YouTube videos of cars in winter time and like really icy environments, they're sliding out. Why is that? Because the coefficient, the force right here is not sufficient to equate to what is necessary to move in a circle. And that's what this little white text here is saying. Okay, if your car wheels aren't sliding in or out, it must be a static frictional force. And then I'm gonna reveal something right here. Ah, a car fails to make a turn when the tires don't have enough grip, when there's not enough friction. You need enough frictional force to move in a circle based on the, the speed and the, the radius of that curvature. If you can't create this amount of force, your car is gonna follow its inertia and move out in a straight line, okay? So here's one example, really focusing on friction. That's really the main idea for, for this section, often seen for cars, okay? But it could apply for other things as well. Friction can be the force that keeps something moving in a circle as long as you have enough friction to equate to this, because this is what is necessary to move in a circle. Okay, for part B, we're looking at vertical circles. So now instead of just swinging something horizontally, maybe now I'm swinging it like this, so it's making this nice vertical circle. Or I just have another picture of another example right here. Maybe imagine a roller coaster with a loop-de-loop, -loop, okay, something like that. So still circular motion. We're gonna see that much of the same processes still apply, but now for a slightly different scenario. This does has, have a couple nuances in it, so make sure you're paying attention and keep good notes. That's my opinion, okay? So, this diagram right here, I have this ball that's attached to a string, just like before. We'll say that the string is some radius r, right? So the length of the string is actually the circle itself, and it's spinning around and around. Let's say it's spinning this way, counterclockwise, okay? Now, when it's moving around, obviously it's gonna start right here. I'm gonna call this position one. A little while later, it'll be right here. I'll call that position two. A little while later, it'll be right here. I'll call that position three. Right here is four. What might be a little tricky at first is that there's gonna be different forces acting in the centripetal direction for things moving in vertical forces. So I'm gonna set up Newton's second law by looking at this motion at four, or at least three, different locations, okay? So here we go. First, let's look at position number one, at location one, right here. What would a free body diagram look like? This object's spinning around and around. 
Well, of course, that ball, that orange ball right there, has some weight, so I'm going to put right there, mg. Sorry, that should be a straight line, of course. And there's a tension force, tension acting upwards. There's T, right? Normally, it's a string. I'd call that tension. If I was to write out the sum of the forces in the centripetal, and remember, let's say towards the center of the circle is the positive direction. What would I have? I would have tension. That's acting towards the center. Uh-oh. Now I have weight. It's acting downwards, of course, like it always is. But because this is a vertical circle, now the weight is acting in the same direction. Well, the opposite, but that same plane as the tension force. This force is, in fact, kind of fighting against circular motion because the weight is acting away from the center. So if I'm saying towards the center is positive, I should subtract the weight. That equals m times a, which for things moving in a circle is mv squared divided by r. So here's the first different thing. Now I have two forces acting in that same centripetal direction. Just like, you know, if I had an object moving to the right, I'd have forces to the right as positive, forces to the left maybe as negative. That's the way I said was, uh, was positive, okay? I would still add them up in the sum of the forces in the x direction. I'm still adding up the sum of the forces in the centripetal, but now I have two forces that are opposing one another. Tension is still towards, weight is now opposing, so I subtract it, okay? Let's now look at scenario two. So now at location two, I'll make this orange right here. Scenario two, when the ball swings up, because I'm spinning it around and around and around. When it's right here, what's the free body diagram look like? There's still weight, and of course that weight should still be acting straight down. There's a little better job. And tension, what direction is it? Well, now the string is like this, right? Tension should be pointing horizontally to the left. The sum of the forces in the centripetal, well, it's tension. Is weight still acting in that centripetal direction towards or away? Mm -mm. That's it. Just like before, perpendicular vectors don't affect one another. I exclude it. That equals mv squared divided by r. Oh, now you see what's different. If we're looking at this object at different locations, you may or may not be incorporating more than one force as it's moving in a circle. Let's look at now position three. I'm gonna switch over to, let's go back to blue. Okay, so now here's position three. So at three, I moved my head around. Sorry about that, that was a little jarring, but my head was gonna be in the way. So at position three, what's my free body diagram look like? Now the ball's right here. Well, I still of course have weight acting down, still mg, oh man, that should be a straight line. There should also still be tension. What direction is tension acting? Also downwards. Now I have two forces. I'm going to make my dot a little bigger. I still have weight acting straight down, but now the tension is also acting straight downwards. So my sum of the forces in the centripetal, I'm still saying towards the center is positive. Well, I would have tension plus mg. Both are acting towards the center of the circle. mv squared divided by r, just like that. So now it actually is going to matter where you are looking at these sums of the forces. You might have slightly different free body diagrams, slightly different net forces that are acting on an object during that time. So now it becomes important. Here we see sometimes there's two forces, sometimes there's one, sometimes they're added, sometimes they're subtracted. You have to just make sure and think about what direction are these forces acting in relation to this centripetal path, which is now vertical, okay? I still want to talk about this vertical circle here, something that's important to recognize. And I move my head back on over to the right. Now, this equation is still talking about, so you want to move in a circle, okay? At this position three, we had this T plus MG. Both were acting downwards, right? Well, if I want to move in a circle, I need some tension and I need some MG. Imagine if I was swinging this ball upwards and then I kind of stopped tugging on it with a string. To be honest, this is better done in person. If you could find an object connected to a string and whirl it around in a circle. Well, imagine what happens if you kind of let off. When it gets to the top, if you're not continuously tugging, if there's not enough tension, the ball or the object kind of peters out and dies. And that's an important idea. I need tension to always be pulling it in a circular path. If the tension went to zero right here, well, if there was suddenly no more tension, there's no center-seeking force going towards the center. So then the ball just kind of dies out and stops moving in a circular path. When the ball gets to the very top, oh, we're kind of lucky. Mg for this particular moment. 
MG is acting downwards. For right here, bare minimum, the tension could go to zero at the slowest possible rate. The slowest or the least amount of tugging, the tension could go to zero, and just for a moment, it could still continue on. But over here, there better still be tension. If there was no tension force right here, then there's no force acting on it towards the center. And then like this kind of dotted line, the ball would just kind of die out and no longer move in a circle. So tension is an important force for something spinning around in a circle. I need there to be tension. The absolute minimum I can get away with is if tension dropped to zero just for a moment right at the top of the circle. I'd still have a little bit of a downward force, but then I'd better be able to continue having a taut, a tight string to keep it curving and arcing. Otherwise, you're going to get this white dotted line kind of petering out and dying scenario. So this right here is important. Okay, It says, at position 3, the minimum speed is right when tension approaches zero. You can imagine if you're looking at this equation, if your velocity is going down, well, it's not going to change the weight, but it might change the tension. You got to go fast enough. When you're making a vertical circle, you got to spin the object fast enough so there's enough tension everywhere. And the slowest you could possibly go is when there's tension right at the top, just for a moment. And then still, there needs to be tension as it continues. Otherwise, you're no longer going to move in a circle. Vertical circles aren't always uniform circular motion. Also looking at this equation, I could have a constant tension, and then the velocity might be changing at different locations. Or if I have a constant velocity, then tension would be changing. So vertical circles can get a little tougher. It's important to recognize, because this often shows up on problems, it might say, what is the minimum speed? Well, the minimum speed is where right at the top, you're allowed to have tension go to zero just for a moment. Okay? But anywhere else, if there is no tension, you no longer have a centripetal force and it's no longer going to move in a circle. I'm just about done. Another kind of cousin to this scenario. Let's say we have a roller coaster problem. Same kind of idea, but now I have this coaster that's moving in a circle. For this coaster, it's kind of already drawn, but I have the weight here, mg, and I have now, it's not tension, it would be the normal force of that track. Ah, some of the forces in the centripetal direction at this location right here, I would have the mg plus the normal force is equal to mv squared divided by r. Obviously, if you're on a roller coaster, you want that car to move in a circle. You don't want the car to go up here and then just plummet to its death. That would happen if the normal force went to zero. So when you're moving in a circle, you need enough speed so there's sufficient normal force. What's the absolute minimum speed a roller coaster could get away with? Well, the normal force could go to zero just for an instant at this location. You'd still have a little bit of weight acting downwards in the centripetal direction, but that's the bare minimum. If you have too slow a speed so the normal force is zero here, or here, or here, or here, that's when your roller coaster falls off the track and you all plummet and die. So a very common type of problem in AP physics is something like find the minimum speed to move in a circle. That's this scenario. It's when you're at the top, the absolute slowest speed is such that the normal force goes to zero. So then you're solving this equation, right? Here I had the normal force go to zero, so it drops out of the equation. Solve for the velocity. Same thing, if it was this scenario, if I asked for the minimum speed that this ball could have, it's when tension is zero in this scenario, so you'd have mg equals mv squared over r. Okay, you're likely going to see this on review from your professor or teacher. If you're in my class, you'll see problems like this in the near future. Okay, so that's a particular scenario that often comes up for vertical forces, vertical circles. Okay, that's it. You'll get lots of practice after watching this video. That's it for now. Thanks a lot for watching.